We've been speaking with top economists to better understand what this economic climate means for companies' bottom lines. Today, I'm speaking with Nouriel Roubini, Professor of Economics and International Business at New York University's Stern School of Business. Professor, thanks so much for joining me. Uh, great being with you today. We'll start off here. What's the biggest risk to a company's bottom line right now? Well, there are different types of risks to a company's uh, bottom line. There are short-term risks, and those derive from the fact that uh, we don't know whether the economy is going to have a soft landing or a hard landing. If there was a hard landing, of course, revenue and profit will be negatively affected, and firms that are highly leveraged and with difficult both balance sheets and P&Ls will be under stress. Firms have also to think about medium long term type of risk and threats. The one deriving from uh, global climate change, from new technology like artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic automation. So you touched on a lot of different topics. We're going to go through each of those one by one. One of the mega threats you mentioned in your book is artificial intelligence. What are the long term implications of AI on companies' bottom lines? Artificial intelligence, machine learning, robotic automation can affect uh, the way they're using labor. AI is going to have major disruptive effects. Some firms are going to survive, some of them will disappear. Entire sectors of the economy will be radically changed by AI. There's also the risk that AI is going to increase income and wealth inequality and lead uh, to a backlash and populism because these technologies are capital intensive, skill buyers and labor saving. If you own the, the machines or the capital that owns the machines, you do well. If you're in the top 10% distribution of skills, education, human capital, probably AI makes you more productive and efficient. But if you are a low or medium value added uh, worker, your jobs and income could, could over time be at risk. That's exactly what my next follow-up question was. Will AI increase wealth inequality? Specifically, how is it going to help or hurt workers? One view says that uh, There'll be tons of new jobs of the future that we don't even know of. So there'll be always a demand for labor. The other one is a more dystopian and worries that eventually many jobs, uh, initially cognitive white collar jobs that are low value added, then blue collar jobs, eventually cognitive and creative jobs could be you know, at risk. Of course, if the economic pie is larger because you have a higher potential growth and productivity growth, can always tax uh, those who are better off, those that are winners, and then redistribute uh, income to those who are left behind because of these uh, technological shocks, what people call UBI or universal basic income or even universal provision of basic services of one sort or another. In your book, one of the solutions you talk about is should the U.S. tax robots? Can you talk to me a little bit about how that would be implemented? You want to probably maximize initially the production and the potential productivity growth. If it implies using more robots or more AI, so be it. But then the income that generated with is going to be acquired by small set of companies or a small set of individuals. So probably the first best policy will be to, to tax the uh, rents, the income and the windfall profits are coming to these uh, winners from uh, technology and AI rather than taxing directly the adoption of uh, robots. And if you tax those, then uh, the adoption will become slower and the benefits in terms of potential growth become smaller as well. I want to talk a little bit about the singularity. What is it and how should economists think about it? Well, some people talk about singularity. Some people talk about uh, AGI or artificial general intelligence. Will the AI make uh, the machines and the robots so much more intelligent than us, or there could be a merger between the AI and the human brain so that we actually become ourselves uh, super intelligent once we get to AGI or singularity? I mean, some of it are philosophical questions on about uh, whether our species, uh, sapiens, is going to survive or whether we're going to have to evolve a merger with a machine. It seems like uh, science fiction, but given the speed of adoption, something quite relevant. Definitely feels like a science fiction film. We'll see what happens. All right, I want to shift gears a little bit. How does globalization and free trade help or hurt the U.S. economy? 
Well, uh, globalization is a little bit like technological innovation. It expands the economic pie because it allows countries to specialize in their comparative advantage. Some countries are labor abundant and therefore have advantage in low-value added uh, manufacturing. Some uh, nations have a lot of natural resources and of course they produce and export. Uh, innovation and trade and globalization increases the economic pie and everybody produces what they have a comparative advantage, sells it and buys cheaper the goods and services produced by others. But like in the case of technology, globalization leads to some winners and some uh, losers. Some people are left behind. This is also related to immigration. So can we talk a little bit about that? So will loosening immigration policy solve the worker shortage or is that the wrong question to be asking? Well, many people are against uh, uh, immigration because they fear that it's going to lead to, you know, job losses or income losses. But the evidence uh, is not consistent with that. We have a shortage now of labor because of aging of populations that reduces potential growth reduces productivity, creates a larger fiscal deficits and implicit liability for the government, those deriving from pay-as-you-go social security and healthcare system. So we need uh, more younger workers to be able also to pay for the benefits of those who are retiring. Of course, you want to have a rational migration policy, not let anybody in, uh, be selective in terms of which kind of people and which kind of skills the founders and CEOs of many of these uh, high-tech companies are, are foreigners. For most advanced economies, uh, migration is a net. Sure. Um, one of the reasons people are leaving other countries is because of climate change. So I want to talk a little bit about that. How should companies be preparing for global warming? Sea rise level, flooding, hurricanes, typhoons, uh, wildfires, uh, droughts, and you name it, is going to damage uh, economic activity. And if you're there, you could have losses. Uh, of course, we're also in a green transition where firms have to achieve individually and then collectively a variety of net zero goals. And so you have to make a lot of investment in using technologies and machinery that is gradually switching from traditional fossil fuels to renewables or other sources of, uh, of energy. Unfortunately, many of the commitment to net zero done by many businesses or even financial institutions are more like a corporate PR rather than real plans. Everybody says we're going to reach net zero, but there's a lot of green washing and green wishing rather than real specific plans. That's why uh, we still have a significant amount of global climate change. And this year is going to be the hottest year in history and next year is going to get worse. And the economic and fiscal damage coming from climate change is going to become very severe very soon. Green inflation is a phenomenon where the production of uh, green metals, those that are important for the green transition, whether it's cobalt, uh, zinc, uh, copper, lithium, iron, and many others, the production of these uh, metals uh, uses a lot of energy. So we need to uh, find a way in which uh, we do the transition faster so that energy becomes cheaper, so that also the production of these metals that are important for the green transition becomes uh, uh, profitable. Otherwise, if uh, these materials are expensive, then the cost of renewable and other forms of alternative energy and green energy remain too high. Will the U.S. remain the world's leading economy? China is shooting itself in the foot. U.S. is instead is still quite dynamic with a lot of innovation. So I think that the private sector actually innovates a lot. U.S. can be in the most advanced technology of the future, AI, machine learning, robotic automation, biomedical research, uh, new materials, uh, space exploration, fintech. But we have in the U.S. many problems. We have a very divided political system, partisanship that is actually damaging of economic activity. We still have to deal with our unfunded liabilities. Uh, we have to have more rational economic policies. So the U.S. is positioned well to remain the leading economy in the world. And China is now showing some elements of structural relative weakness, but we cannot take our advantage for granted. We have to also invest in our people, in our future, in our human capital and our skills to become and remain uh, 
competitive and productive and a high knowledge economy as well. 